Throughout history, free thinkers have outraged the religious with their wacky ideas about the virtues of free speech, reason, and of course, eating babies. Now, God is dying, and it's time to dispose of his remains. From the pits of hell, Satan sends two puppets of the imperialist West and the Zionist Jews against God, Islam, and tiny kittens to bring you their propaganda and conspire for a new world order. This is Secular Jihadist for a Muslim Enlightenment with Ali Rizwi and Armin Navabi. All right, welcome everybody to another episode of Secular Jihadist for a Muslim Enlightenment. My name is Ali Rizvi. And with me is Armin Navabi. Armin, how are you? Good. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I just answered okay, that. Right? I know. Yeah. <laughs> so, <anyway. laughs> See, I'm trying so, to. I'm trying to answer that a little bit more. Um, you've been you doing better. It. Yeah, I'm. Mean, I'm trying to do better, but now you ruined it because now, like, well, I already answered you. I already answered yeah, you so with so much I enthusiasm. I, I answered yeah. that with so much enthusiasm, and it meant nothing because you had to ask me again. Anyways. <laughs> Uh, okay, I so just want to say, I'm, guys, that uh, I've been hearing these awkward starts on your <laughs> podcast for a while, and this is the first time I see it live, so I'm so glad to... <laughs> surreal, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> surreal. It's amazing and the voice you're after, hearing... After all yeah, these so. years, uh, you still, you know, the, you still uh, can't have an unawkward uh, start. <laughs> That's our trademark. That's our trademark. So the voice that you're hearing right now is of our guest for today. And this is uh, my good friend, uh, Wissam Sharafuddin. Um, Wissam is a former imam uh, who uh, came from Lebanon. And now he lives in Dearborn, which is uh, the city with the largest population of Muslims in the United States. Uh, he's, he's very active there in the community. Uh, he is a co-founder of a group called Muslimish, which you may remember from our previous guests, Nura and Babi and uh, Ibrahim Abdullah. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a growing organization where questioning Muslims and ex-Muslims can come together for open dialogue uh, as part of a common community. Mm. So uh, Muslim is actually uh, holding its semi-annual conference in Detroit on uh, October 26th, so just next month, uh, where I'll be speaking um, the, uh, as well. Uh, and uh, the topic of the conference is, uh, can Islam and science coexist? So they're going to be talking about the compatibility oh. with Islam with science. Um, and uh, today what we're going to do, though, is uh, we really want to get into because I've known Wassam for a long time. I've I've spoken at almost all of their events, and it's it's you know you guys know that I really like the organization. Uh, but I really want to get into Wassam's story. I want to find out uh, how he got into this work, what his experiences as an imam when he was back in Lebanon. So uh, Wassam, if you're cool with that, can you start? Wait. Before yeah, you ahead, before you start, can I just say first of all, I really lo love the brand, the name Muslimish. It's the perfect name for both ex-Muslims and questioning Muslims, right? And I also really, really appreciate that the that the branding is ex-Muslims and questioning Muslims, not reforming Muslims, right? Questioning yeah. Muslims. That's exactly what we need to push for. Uh, so I, I just yeah, so fantastic. Yeah, I love, uh, but Muslimish is fantastic. Like Muslimish, like Muslim uh, ish is is such a great name. I don't know who came up with that, but kudos to whoever came up with yeah, that name. And so I, I got it. You know, on that with some actually, because we talk over here about what does the word Muslim mean, and you know, Armin says that you know a Muslim is someone who believes in Islam, believes in Allah, the Quran, and uh, the that the Quran is a, a perfect word of God. And then I say that no, it doesn't necessarily have to mean the Quran. It can just mean Allah and Muhammad and so on. But um, Muslimish is a really good term that actually yeah, encompasses like that. the identity part of it. So, so it's um, yeah, that's yeah. another thing. So, I also have to say kudos to that. Yeah. But um, so, congratulations on the group, congratulations on the event. But let's let's talk about you. So, what is your story? How did you go from uh, being Wassam to Imam to the sort of secular work that you do now? Right. So, uh, first of all, I wanna. Uh, give a second of appreciation for you guys for what you do. And um, um, it is not a very popular uh, work in most of uh, the world. So uh, when, when a person does work that is necessary for enlightenment and it's not popular, uh, that is a definition of what becomes later in history as heroes. So uh, I wanna you know, show my appreciation to what you do. 
Um, you know, when we started in this work, there were very few uh, voices of questioning Islam or reform is, or um, uh, ex-Muslims that were very um, allowed in the world. And now, uh, there, you know, the movement has changed uh, drastically, uh, thanks to people like you. Uh, so I I start I mean I was born in the United Arab Emirates and uh, my family was a liberal family and uh, uh, but the history of my uh, my family is is a religious family it's a big family within the Shia uh, community uh, it goes back in lineage to a, a large group of scholars uh, uh, descending from Imam Hussein. Uh, who is the grandson of the Prophet and a big uh, a saint figure in Shia Islam. And um, uh, so I kind of stumbled upon religion for, for, for many different reasons. I, I look back retrospectively trying to find out why did I become religious at such a young age. But I think there are many factors. You grew up, both of you, uh, you had you know experience growing up in Islamic countries. Uh, so you know that you know you are taught in school basically Islam. You're indoctrinated with Islam, and uh, the age that we grow up in, there were not much uh, entertainment. Otherwise, uh, TV channels, cartoons, hero figures. I feel that I grew up me and my friends having the hero figures as the hero figures of Sira of the Islamic history. Uh, these were these were our Superman and uh, and Spiderman. Are these Sahaba? Are these battles? You know, so uh, I, I think that grew in us. Although uh, my family was liberal, uh, it, uh, you know, I was uh, inclined towards religion from a very very young age. All the schools I attended, you know, Islamic uh, Islamic uh, studies are part of any school over there. But specifically, my you know, I happened to go to private schools which were Islamic institutes at a young age uh, because they had uh, better discipline my father put me in them and that kind of also gave me more knowledge more uh, 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 you know um, association with uh, religious figures religious scholars uh, the best in the Islamic world as you know in the Gulf countries can afford the best teachers so they contract the best scholars from Jordan and, and um, Egypt and Syria and Iraq. And you have these uh, big scholars, most of which have a background like in the Islamic Brotherhood secretly or whatever. Uh, but they're, you know, um, they're very big scholars, uh, very well uh, educated in Islam. And they were our teachers. They were our imams, they were our sheikhs, our Quran teachers, etc. Um, and growing up, uh, you know, learning this, the Sunni uh, school of thought, I then went into an Islamic institute that was uh, accredited by Al Azhar University. And I didn't know it was so extensive, but it was very, very extensive. And you get a diploma from Al Azhar from there. Uh, and then after the first uh, Gulf War, we moved back to Lebanon. My family originally is from Lebanon. And uh, but wait, I, did you get a diploma from Al Azhar? In yes, that sense, but, when you went to that school? Right. This is accredited by Al-Azhar. It's a very old school, which is wow. Waqif. It's an endowment uh, before even United Arab Emirates were, was formed. Right. Uh, For people Waqif. that don't know, Al-Azhar University is the main center of Islamic teaching uh, for Sunni Islam all over the world, right? Like, so just so um, for Shia Islam, that would be probably the, um, you know, Jose El Mia in Qom. Uh, Iran. In, in Iran, yeah. yeah. And for Sunni Islam, it would be Al Hazar University in Egypt. Yeah. Yeah. So when I went to Lebanon, I kind of got in touch with my Shia background, and I started studying Hausa studies in Lebanon. Mm -hmm. We didn't last in Lebanon very long. We came to uh, to Canada as refugees, and um, um, in Canada, I, I, you know, I, I've associated with local scholars. Uh, studied with them uh, briefly, continued my uh, studies and Islamic uh, activity. I, I became active Islamically when I moved to Canada. So uh, I, it wasn't the intention. I, I felt that, uh, you know, the, the, the image that we had of the West, of America, was, you know, based on the movies. And uh, I remember a, a show that used to be called Charles and Charles. I don't know if you're familiar with it. But it was about a foreign student who went to a, a school in California. And that was oh, the yes. image for me. Yeah. <laughs> Do you remember that? I remember. Yeah, I remember uh, that, vaguely. Yeah. That was the image I was expecting. You know, I was expecting to go into the school and I'm going to be friends with, uh, you know, some uh, uh, blonde girl, you know, the, the Arabic <laughs> obsession. 
uh, and um, uh, you know, so I really didn't know what to expect. But when we got to uh, to Canada, we went to uh, you know, so we're refugees, so we're living in a in, in, an, in an urban area. We went to a school which had uh, a lot of diversity, and there were uh, a movement of like anti-immigration. There were uh, a wave of what was called at that time skinheads. If you're familiar with them, it's mm. like a yeah. A white supremacist kind of a group. and Well, yeah, I mean, Majid Nawaz has a lot of history with them, too. He was attacked by them right? Uh, and frequently they, when he was growing up. Yeah. They originated in UK. So so anyway, we had a negative. We had like a hostile environment instead of a, a, a positive environment in uh, for assimilation. We didn't really experience very positive environment. That, I think, made me and other friends resort back to Islam as an identity to strengthen ourselves and to mm. unite together. So I feel that made me more religious and actually made a lot same. of my friends uh, the same way. Um, so I actually became more religious when we when we moved to Canada. And, mm. and I had the, 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 the Islamic knowledge. Um, and as I started learning English, uh, we right away, you know, started the Islamic fellowship of high school students. Mm. And we were active, like we were, we had five meetings a week in the in the high school. So we had a meeting every lunchtime. So our goal was not to let any Muslim go to the lunch place because it's full of haram things, you know, like music and, and uh, girls and etc. So we were... Um, By the really, way, just, this is uh, just one one of many, many other examples to support what I, uh, what I often say is that the best way to fight Islam is to befriend Muslims. And the best way to promote Islam is to victimize Muslims. But yeah, but this is just one of the many other examples. But go on, sorry. That's true. I agree with you. Um, uh, so from there on, well, then we emigrated to uh, the United States and uh, we received, you know, finally our uh, citizenship uh, through my uh, mother's family who has been in Michigan for, for decades. And um, uh, I continued. I was by that time an Islamic activist, uh, both in the Sunni uh, uh, community and the Shia community. I was also active with the Tablighi Jama'at, which is uh, it's a it's a, a groups that uh, propagate Islam through very traditional means, originated from India, etc. And, and different groups. And uh, I I continued my study with Iran with uh, Qom, uh, oh. the Hausa and Qom through distance study. There was one Hausa that had Arabic distance study mm. and we studied with them uh, for years. At the same time, I was active in the community. I studied with some Wait, uh, local uh, so what is What is Hausa? Hausa is a Shia Islamic school, but it's traditional, oh. so it doesn't have an academic system. It has its okay. own traditional system. Hosea el Qom, the Persian version of it. Wait, so you had you basically studied in both the center of Sunni Islamic studies and the center of Shia. I, I think you're one of the only ones in the world that has ex, <laughs> has studied in both. That's amazing. Wow. It was more common before. I think that contributed to my open mindedness. Okay. Because I can see the delusion in both. Uh, each one thinks that the <laughs> other is. Uh, <laughs> So I already had oh, both the of best. them. I, I I suffered from that, and I felt that I th I think now retrospectively that that helped me a lot because the Shia they always thought that oh you know what this guy might be Sunni and he's trying to make us Sunni and uh, you know and the Shia and the Sunnis always thought that this guy is Shia you know he might be <laughs> trying to make to make us Shia so. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so I was kind of, um, um, uh, you know, uh, isolated from from both, or maybe distrusted a little bit sometimes mm. from both communities. They distrusted my Islamic unity intentions. You know, they thought that um, too mixed to be uh, Shia or Sunnah alone. Mm. Uh, but that actually led me to actually um, um, into reform Islam into. Uh, uh, you know, through studying and you see all the corruption in the Islamic institution, all the selectiveness and uh, etc. It's an ocean of uh, uh, of, of contradictions. Uh, as, a, as a Muslim, I thought, you know, we, you know, there, we should go back to the basics. We should go back to the uniting factors. We should uh, try to avoid uh, controversial, uh, weak hadith, etc. You know, traditions that are not authentic, not dwell on them. And that led us to actually create a movement for uh, reform Islam. We were fought, uh, you know, death threats, uh, etc. Uh, from that time, about 2004, 2005. 
Um, and we created the Islamic Institute for Religious Studies, Humanities, and Dialogue, kind of a reform Islam movement, which I was the chairman of. Um, but what happened finally, to make a long story short, I'm sorry, it took time, a uh, long time explaining this. Oh, but, no, uh, this, is, uh, this is actually yeah. fascinating, and you're telling it really well. So, And it's a podcast, so please take yeah. your time. This is, no, we can I, chill that way. No, yeah, I, I, I hope it actually lasts longer. Yeah, go for <laughs> it. You. Keep going. So, um, yeah, so basically um, in 2008, what happened is um, we received a question in Irshad. That was the acronym for the that Islamic modern movement, uh, which was basically, you know, we were uh, ostracized from the community at that time uh, as a reform movement, as a movement that saw that there is no such thing as Sunni and Shia, and they're all just uh, general resources of knowledge. Uh, and a Muslim should be larger than that, that not all of the Qur'an uh, is necessarily active today. Some of it should be inactive. Uh, these were blasphemous thoughts wow. for uh, for Muslims. Yes. Um, so in 2008, we re- 2008, the research, I think 2007, 2008, the research about the fossil that was nicknamed Lucy, the research about it came out public. I know it was discovered very early on in the 70s, but... It took that that much time for the research to be finalized. So for, for those who are not familiar uh, with this, can you just explain uh, Lucy? Uh, yeah, Islam? so um, I probably wouldn't be the right person to explain it, but as far just as... briefly. You know, yes, so it's basically a, a group of fossils that were found in Ethiopia, in Africa, uh, that were a very old uh, uh, ape uh, fossils that dated back to about 6.5 uh, million years. They were kind of complete. They give a complete picture of the of the ape at that time, which considered one of our um, ancestors, mm. uh, a common ancestor. It was a big uh, scientific discovery, another one that lines up with the theory of evolution, of course. Uh, and we received a question about it in Irshad, and um, naturally I would forward the question to the, the Office of Jurisprudence, but they had no answer really for that uh, question. It was purely scientific. And the question was, how do you, uh, how do you explain this Islamically? Mm. Mm-hmm. So, um, so just my... uh, for the audience, uh, the Lucy is uh, Australopithecus. Um, uh, it was uh, a Ali. Your beard species. is your beard is keep touch the microphone and it makes a scratching noise every time it touches hey, it. Hey, it's Sunna. Okay. All right. Okay. I'll move it away. The uh, yeah. It's uh, so Australopithecus is is one of our uh, ancestors. Anyway, go on. No, but and also another thing is that uh, I remember a lot of people. Uh, came up with some conspiracy theories for why it was named Lucy, because Lucy is a female version of Lucifer. So, oh, yeah. really? Yeah. So, okay. so people thought like this must be like some uh, satanic or Illuminati conspiracy behind this having this. So, all right. Yeah. So before we got disconnected, I was just saying that um, I remember when it was happening, a lot of people. I don't know a lot of people, but some people were saying this must be an Illuminati satanic thing, Lucy, because Lucy is the female version of Lucifer, right? So <laughs> I, I thought they, they meant, you know, so anyways, that's it. Anyways, go on. <laughs> yeah, I had friends who thought that they were planted by, you know, a Zionist conspiracy. Yeah, exactly, uh, exactly. Yeah. Illuminati, Zionist or whatever planted, but the, they thought that the name Lucifer is basically, the name Lucy is hinting to that, right? But go on. Yeah. So anyway, so uh, it ended up with me taking the responsibility of actually trying to answer that question, uh, which ended up in me uh, uh, starting a research about Islam and evolution. Mm. And uh, I started the research. I'm engineer by training. I have, uh, you know, my uh, bachelor's and post bachelor degrees are all in engineering and technical fields. So uh, I started, uh, you know, learning for the first time, uh, really evolution. And uh, what I thought I'm gonna I'm gonna learn in a few days and then write an article about took me months, literally. Uh, of continuous daily, daily research, and uh, it actually uh, deconstructed uh, my myself. I deconstructed my knowledge, 
deconstructed my understanding of life. Uh, the whole model of life has changed with what science has has discovered for all these years that we you know it's uh, it's away from our public understanding you know it's, it has always been an issue the public perception of science scientists are in a in a valley and people are in a different valley uh, so I've uh, just understood the um, um, the theory of, of evolution I could not reconcile it with uh, an Islamic version. I could not mm. reconcile it with creationism, and I had to submit to uh, science. <laughs> and when right. I did that, it started to deconstruct my Islamic knowledge, and it deconstructed it to the ground, and I had to rebuild a new understanding uh, uh, of, of Islam, a new understanding of, of everything that I've studied before. Well, technically, you could, you could, you say you submitted. So technically, it's still a, you're an Islamic. You're submitting, right? I don't know. I'm just trying to say. <laughs> no, anyways, never mind. No, but um, hey, can we actually make that? You could, you could, just like Ali says, like a sunnah to uh, to blaspheme because Muhammad did that. We could also say it's Islamic to submit to to science because that's what Islam is: submission. Right. Right. And Armin, you have a problem with reform, and you think that that sounds perfectly rational. Okay. Yeah, because actually, this <laughs> proves my point. The entire point is like, with a ref with reform, people get lazy and they just feel like instead of questioning things, they say they just stick with Islam. But then, mm -hmm. actually, when science actually hits you in the head, when reality hits you in the head, you're like, that's that's the and you know, you all of a sudden the comfort that the reform gave you becomes even more uncomfortable. Right. Yeah. So, anyways, yeah, I don't no, want to get into that. But I don't want to get into that because the. But I, I, I am, I, yeah. I need to. Yeah, I need to hear more of the story. So, yeah, you're. So this is fascinating. So you're, uh, you know, so you come from. You know, you're born in the UAE. You go to Lebanon, right? You uh, then go through this. Uh, uh, you come to Canada. That's where you become more religious. Uh, you start a sort of a reform yeah. group. You're faced with the reality of evolution, and now you're kind of stuck you have to submit to science so and then so you have you've done engineering you've got a thing from alazar you've got a thing from Qom. i mean you're <laughs> you seem like you're a pretty educated guy yeah. so what made you decide to continue down this line and how was muslimish born after that yeah so um of course after that uh i call it enlightenment uh, for lack of a better term, I, I had a, I had a depression really because uh, I'm, I'm not a person who uh, grew up with Islam lightly. You know, it has been my way of life since I was, uh, since I, you know, I started forming memory. Uh, I've dedicated my life to it. I've um, basically uh, my high school years, my uh, uh, university years. I was always in thawb. I was always in sunnah everywhere. I was always representing, um, you know, fundamental Islam everywhere. I've uh, spoken, I've dedicated tens of hours. I've gotten married based on Islam and I've gotten divorced based on Islam. So I've, you know, sacrificed a lot for this. I've, I had a very, very emotional relationship with uh, God and I've spent so many hours uh, with like Salat al-Layl, the night prayers. And Ooh, uh, that wow. was a... That was my style of life. I was a very spiritual just, person. Just to make it clear to our audience, okay, so uh, the night prayers, if you do them, that means you're really dedicated because these are the, prayer, these are the uh, prayers that you don't have to do, right? So imagine you don't have to do five prayers a day, and this is what all Muslims have to do, but then you're adding on top of that late night, you're doing extra prayers. So that means like you're like anybody that any that's actually uh, in Iran, for example, to show somebody is very to, to be able to show somebody is very religious. We say like, oh, they they do night prayers like, holy shit. Wow. These people are very religious. But anyways, go on. So uh, so for me, it was a, it's a major depression because all my purpose, my daily life from the moment I wake up till the moment I sleep, uh, is, is, it's all by Islam. I, I lived second by second by the teachings of Islam. Of course, we're humans. We're always going to have these moments that, uh, that we resort back to our humanness. But 
but otherwise I was very, very dedicated and uh, uh, and I had the depression because now I all, all of a sudden I've lost uh, purpose, I've lost you know uh, my understanding and mm. I went through this period of time and I had no friends that I knew that uh, had the similar similar experience mm. um, and some of my friends uh, of course I shared these with them and some of my friends they, they they shared my questioning some of my friends rejected it they thought that I am being you know manipulated by the shaitan by you know the devil and that I need to be to do more prayer. They really felt sympathy for me. They felt that I'm getting lost, you know. Uh, um, so, uh, so I had less. I lost also a lot of friends, um, and I got more secluded from the community. Um, and then I discovered at a certain point that I have to keep hush about uh, my thoughts because uh, people don't react, you know, um, uh, rationally to to right. people questioning, you know. Uh, you right away become a danger on society. Uh, you, uh, or sometimes you looked at like uh, it reminds me of the interview with uh, Muhammad Hash, uh, Hisham, mm. uh, where the scholar told him that you need to leave this interview and go to the to the hospital, to the mental mm. hospital. You start mm. you start being looked at as a, as with a mental illness, and uh, so and I have children, so I also don't want my children to be stigmatized in the community. So I understood that you know questioning is. Uh, is for intellectuals. I have to. I cannot just uh, express my opinion uh, freely, especially living in in Dearborn. When you talk, when you say Dearborn, you're talking about. You have to think of the Middle East. You can't think of America, <laughs> uh, <laughs> except Wait. for the except for the law. You know. Can you explain uh, that to people? Because people might not know what you're talking about right now. So, you know, there's the authority of the government and then there's the authority of society. And when you're living in a society which is the largest Muslim society outside the, the Islamic world, uh, you're basically living in a Muslim society. Uh, you're right. no, so this, so people, people that might not even know you're talking about a, uh, a city. So this is the largest um, Muslim community, uh, Muslim populated city in North America, correct? In the United States. Correct. Some say in the in the world outside the Islamic world. Wow. Uh, in okay. terms of dense density uh, of of Muslims in it. Um, so um, yeah. So so. But when I went, uh, I came into terms. I started understanding. Uh, uh, you know uh, the the purpose of purpose, like like they say, and I started you know um, uh, really getting in touch with with myself. You see, Islam, the spirituality of Islam, always wants you to annihilate yourself and mm. get in touch with the external being. Uh, while uh, and that at that time, I really got in touch with myself. Uh, it's it's kind of like coming back to life, that self that has been annihilated for all these years. Now it's the focus uh, of me. It's you know some Sufis also say that, but. Uh, so I, I went internally and I rediscovered myself and I, you know, I re-understood life in a different uh, positive way and it actually became more positive. This life became more important. Every second of it is not to be wasted on anything negative. The colors of this life became all of a sudden more vibrant and this life became such a beautiful place that I don't want to waste any second more uh, not enjoying that huge opportunity and very improbable thing that I'm alive in such a beautiful world, uh, this uh, this blue planet. So um, uh, from there on, um, I started being active with other uh, organizations that uh, promote science. And uh, one of these organizations is called Center for Inquiry. Mm-hmm. And uh, in 2012, they told me, you know, there is a... A guy like you in uh, in New York, his name is Ibrahim. He's also in touch with CFI in New York, and they got us in touch with each other. Mm. And it was an amazing uh, Google Hangout <laughs> mm. uh, with that uh, with that guy. And I went. To, I with told him, "Listen, Ibrahim Abdullah, who's uh, also a previous guest on this podcast. So yeah. make sure you go and check out that episode. Yeah, yeah. So with." I'll leave that. I'll leave the rest of the story for that podcast <laughs> because he narrates the story of also how Muslimish was born. But basically, the name, this name, the the ishness in it, uh, you know that that uh, um, uh, suffix that when added to a word, it it makes it converts a noun into an adjective. It makes it 
it blurs the meaning it taints it with confusion mm. it it shocks it with hesitation it uh, it makes it somewhat or a bit as it is so it's not muslim but you know you're kind of you know a muslim and that mm. hesitation that doubt that questioning is what we want to embrace is people are uncomfortable with something like that well, I, I just became uncomfortable by saying you're kind of a Muslim because as an ex-Muslim, I don't think I'm kind of a Muslim at all. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you you can have that feeling too, of course. Right. Uh, but we wanted to create a space for those who feel that, who feel that right. um, they associate with, you know, uh, we as a, we as a, you know, as this social species, it's very hard to separate our culture from our religion, our emotions from our intellectuality, mm. things get mixed up. And if we are sometimes pre pre requiring people to separate them, uh, sometimes people they just feel it's a difficult task and they avoid it. Mm. Um, so we wanted to create a space where you know what, just be comfortable with that uncomfort, be comfortable with that doubt, be comfort, comfortable with confusion, because that question, and we adopted it as a, as a logo, that question mark mm. is, the, is the beginning, is the prerequisite for, for, for knowledge. Yes. Uh, it is the path of knowledge. You know what I when so, people no, no, say it, that, what, but Ali, but this is the reason. Again, just I, don't please patrons, don't get upset with me. The reason this is another reason why I love what, what everything you're saying and against the reform because the whole reform is about making you com comfortable about not knowing and making you comfortable about just accepting that you oh, you don't know. This scholar says this. This verse could mean that. But I like the confusion and the. And embracing that being uncomfortable, embracing the fact that there's something wrong here and not running away from it much more as a, as a strategy. Whether you're some, a Muslim that is uncomfortable and you have questions or you are an ex-Muslim, you completely abandon it. Embracing that confusion is much better than creating a, you know, fake comfort that you know you, you, that the reform does anyways just had yeah, to do that so you really uh, you really have you honestly do have a way with words is a way that you described it yeah uh, you know like adding that hesitation it's it's almost poetic so I, I and one other thing i like about this is that you know when people talk about well there's ex-muslims and then there's the muslimish i don't look at that as two different things i look at it as linear you know, no it's, i see it as two different important no, I see it as two different important things. No, no, not uh, you, not you. I've I've heard people talk about this. I actually think that it's a linear thing. You're you start with that. You know, you're getting it right when people start to question. And all of us have been through that phase, right? All of us who grew into this, like there was a point when we started questioning, we started doubting. That was one place, and then you know the rest of it. The, the, the when people do become ex-Muslims, that is a destination. Um, right. The the, the, the Muslimish sort of phase is more of the journey. And I uh, think that it could um, also be a destination, though. Here's, I actually see a, a it Muslim, can be, yeah. I see Muslims doing something that is required that the ex-Muslim uh, movement does not offer. It's a home for people that are struggling uh, with Islam, and you know, so ex-Muslim movement does help does provide content for Muslims that are struggling and doubting, but it doesn't provide a community a home for Muslims that are struggling and doubting, right? And this is what I love about the, Mus uh, you know, uh, uh, the Muslimish model r r rather than the reform model because it's providing a place for Muslims that are still Muslim and they just confuse and have doubting. I think there needs to be a place for them where the ex-Muslim movement is not offering. And I think that's the beauty of it. It could be a destination. I mean, even if they remain, even if it's not a pathway towards a, uh, a being ex-Muslim, that's a perfectly it's, it's it's important to tell people that's a perfectly p good place to be to act you know being for people that to make them be okay with just saying i don't know i have doubts right uh, that's much better than you know people that are certain i mean that's a very honest position to take and i and i and i that's why i love this model right so we, we try not to you know as a movement we create a safe space for questioning to take place mm. And we don't expect people to reach to a specific conclusion, right? Exactly, yeah. So we just let them em embrace the, the journey and be comfortable with it. And we respect their journey of the mind. Um, 
as long as you know that there is a questioning factor because if a person is certain then i think you know when we interview people when they you know apply to any of our meetups in the 12 different cities uh, we are at uh, we the one of the questions that the the moderator asks them is is if they are you know certain with we have certainty about islam if if mm. they're comfortable with everything about islam because if that is if that's what where they at then Muslims is not the right place for them. You know, there are other organizations that they might be more comfortable in. Right. Uh, but Muslim is a place where for people, and this is, you know, I mean, one of the most important things is that I feel that most Muslims are Muslimish. Mm. <laughs> but, okay. you know, it's just that they're comfortable where they're at. Mm. And uh, but it's if to if you, I remember one of our speak we invited a very important speaker to our uh, first conference in Dearborn, and he stood up and he said, uh, you know what, I'm I'm a Muslim, mm. and uh, I'm not Muslimish, and uh, I believe in Islam and I believe in Quran, but uh, I don't believe that Prophet Muhammad was the best person who was on earth. I believe uh, my father was. Uh. <laughs> and for me, and for me, that was yes, exactly. You're a Muslimish, you know. <laughs> yes, <laughs> because that makes you an apostate, right? In, <laughs> yes, in it does. <laughs> a blasphemer. Yes, yeah, yeah, yes yeah. It's, it's your bl- That's blasphemy. Can but I, I mean, quote you I, on that? By the way, I'm going like I'm going to quote you on this. Most Muslims are Muslimish. I love that. Um, that. Yeah. I'm, I, I don't actually. I'm going to quote you on that. But you allow me or not? No, so never mind. <laughs> but then, uh, but another but, thing, uh, when, okay. when you mention, when yeah. you mention, I just want to like a lot of people in our audience might get triggered by the mention of space, safe space. I just want to say that this is the, what safe spaces were meant to be. Like this is the proper use of a, sa- a safe space, right? A place yes. where people are actually challenging each other and question. Everybody can question everything rather than a place that, you know, it's not like a. You know, bubble wrapping people and not letting anybody get hurt by anything. That's that's not what safe spaces are meant to be. Right. This is right. this is the proper. Way. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Right. I yeah. I couldn't have said it better. With some, I want to talk more about just your personal thing. And obviously, if there's something over here that you're not comfortable talking about, then let me know. But you mentioned that you got married in Islam. You you got divorced in Islam. The the reason I want to talk about this is because when people talk about how hey, this religion doesn't make sense, you have to be secular, what other force is there but reason? They don't realize that a lot of times when you change your mind and you take the step to move forward and think in a different way and approach life in a different way, then you actually lose people in your life. Families break up. There is there is a much bigger cost than just giving up um, a, a set of ideas. So... Uh, I, I wanted to actually, and the other thing, you know, you talked about people embracing the journey. Uh, you told us a little anecdote when we, we, we at your conference at Harvard, which I was at as well, um, about how you were at the beach and, you know, you said that your daughter at, at that time, I don't know if she still does, chooses to wear the hijab. She's an adolescent. She chooses to wear it. You know, she knows obviously what you think about it, but you see people looking at you and just judging you like, oh, my God, he's making his daughter wear the hijab and he's sitting there in shorts. And you're like, no, no, not me. <laughs> but so some of these, I, I find these aspects of the stories you tell actually the most interesting because they talk about the consequences of like, you know, how this affects human beings as people and our families and our relationships. So it, Can you just go into if you're comfortable with it? Uh, just talk about wh- what happened with your marriage and divorce and whether that had anything to do with uh, any of this. Yeah, I mean, uh, instead of me uh, talking about my personal story, uh, maybe I'll just mention because, you know, I live in a in a community of uh, of also Muslim and, and people that we connect with. Uh, and I hear things all, all the time. So I'm going to share with you, you know, some some of the things that also affected me, you know, in that in that uh, same uh, you know, a storyline. So, for example, I was talking to um, uh, a friend of mine, um, you know, and we and he was, you know, he was questioning also. But then, you know, all of a sudden he felt that he needs to stop questioning. And when I asked him, why, why is that? Why all of a sudden you feel that, you know, you feel scared all of a sudden? 
He said, you know, I, you know, my, my father died out of cancer. Um, I, I was a young, young age and I've always, always imagined that I'm going to be meeting him again. Aww. And, uh, and I know that this line of questioning might let me lose that vision. Mm. And I know it is the rational thing to do. And I know 100% I'm going to get to that. Like, I know it. I know that I'm going to go there. But I prefer to stay in, the, in this fantasy. I, I, you know, and, and I couldn't understand that. Yeah. Uh, but I thought about it for a while afterwards. And uh, maybe because I don't have the same personal experience. But, uh, uh, you know, people, uh, you know, th- religion becomes part of the tissue of our emotions and sometimes taking out some parts of religion or taking out religion altogether is like ripping parts of yourself and sometimes it doesn't it's fatal sometimes you know it's not an mm. easy surgery it has to be done with so much care it needs a support system it needs sympathy mm. uh, because it intermixes and that's why indoctrinating children with religion is such a horrible thing right um it's such a horrible thing it's something that i'm public very publicly condemning all the time is that let them decide for themselves because you are hurting them so much so personal stories i mean there are numerous stories i mean the thing is it is you know i feel that i've i've experienced lots of pain and I've lost a lot of opportunities in life mm. because, because of religion, because mm. of my understanding of religion, because of religion, because of uh, Islam. And I want others, I, you know, I wish someone has come to me early on mm. to uh, free my mind from that uh, shackles. And that's why I feel that, you know what, just like I wish that someone 10 years, I would have won 10 more years of my life right. if someone has reached out to me. I want to I reach out. I want to do my duty. I want to reach out uh, to, to, to other people just in case. I'm, I'm not like recruiting or, you know, uh, you know, trying to convert people. Each person has their personal journey. But uh, just be there if they need me for support. Just be there if they're looking for knowledge or truth or information. Um, so can you give of, some... Oh, go on, sorry. Go ahead, go ahead, Armin. No, I just wanted some examples from what you lost when for, because of Islam. I'll just give you a, a technical example, not to go to the, emo, you know, a lot, like the heavy emotional stuff. I went but the heavy the, emotional stuff as well, though. <laughs> <laughs> All right, go. Yeah, yeah. The, the reason we're pushing you with some, and it's, it's not that... Again, if you're not comfortable talking about it, that's perfectly fine. A lot of people aren't. But the mm-hmm. reason we are is because these are the things that people really relate to there. You know, right. when you mm-hmm. said, right now, I'll give you an example. When you said, when you told me the story about that guy when his father died and he said, I just want to be in this space where I have hope that I'll mm-hmm. see him again. Um, I felt the exact same way when my, when my father died in 2001. Mm-hmm. By that time, I was already an atheist. I didn't really used to talk about it that much. But... I remember I had an uncle, and now I'll, I'll tell you a quick sort of story. My One of my uncles uh, who lived in Montreal, he also died recently. Uh, so he was there, and he, he was kind of, he was very secular. It was kind of like you. And uh, everybody was praying, and they were doing all this stuff. And I just kind of wanted to stay in that space. I'm like, you know, yeah, I do want to see him again. You know, and I, I didn't want to. I was very, very uncomfortable. And then he came, and he just told me one thing. And I asked him about it. I was like, is it going to happen? What do you think? Is there anything after this? Is there, like, whatever, I don't know. Like, afterlife, quantum physics, I don't know. Like, I didn't understand anything at the time. And he just looked at me. He's like, he's like, it's in your DNA. He's alive. He's alive. He's through you. He's actually physically alive through you. You don't need spirituality. You don't need anything. You mm-hmm. know? It's right there in your genetics. And for some reason, that just hit me, and it solved the problem. Mm-hmm. And it may not work that way for everybody, but... Just like when you told me that story, I got reminded of this. The more Thanks st- for uh, sharing these things this. you, yeah. yeah, and the more things like this that you talk about, I think there may be other people who are listening to this who, who would hear it. But I did, again, only what you're I comfortable didn't, with. I didn't. I when my when my mom died, people kept on asking me like, "Aren't you sad that you're not going to see her again?" 
uh, if you're an, if you're an atheist and don't believe in God and stuff, and like, hey, I'm just happy she's not in hell, right? Because mm-hmm. everybody keeps talking about afterlife as if it's just about heaven. Afterlife comes the package, and they kept on telling us most of our lives that most people are going to end up in hell. And my mom didn't pray. My mom drank alcohol. My mom didn't go to the mosque. And most likely, based on everything what they told us, if to, if anything about Islam was true, my mom would have been in hell right now. So I like, you know, I'm actually I'm actually very happy to know that my mom is not right now being sadistic, being tortured by a sadistic God. And if you know, if if afterlife even introduced a slight possibility of that, it's better that she's completely gone than even a slight chance of that. So, anyways, that's what I thought. So. I didn't want there to be any afterlife, but it's not like the universe checks with us what we want to see what's real or not. But can you right. give us can you give us the technical example, and also if you're comfortable <laughs> after that the heavy emotional one? Yeah, I mean one of the most beautiful thing, by the way, that I've I've heard in that uh, uh, is is Richard Dawkins' uh, opening statement in uh, uh, unweaving the rainbow. Mm. Uh, and some uh, people they actually ask for that passage to be read in their eulogies Uh, this is how powerful it is where he says that uh, it starts saying that we die and that's why we're lucky and then he goes on Um, it's a beautiful passage really and it puts it really positively and uh, the gist of it is that it was such a beautiful you know such a beautiful opportunity to be alive Mm. in the beginning so no matter what, you know, everything else is natural. Uh, and I'm glad that, you know, um, I'm glad that there isn't someone who's really picking and choosing, who's surviving and who's dying. That I feel is much worse uh, trauma than uh, just, you know, you know, accepting uh, nature and, and science and natural factors. Um, so, you know, wh- one of the things, for example, when I, when I graduated from engineering, I got an offer in, in AT&T in Seattle. Mm. And um, I had I had uh, like promised um, you know a form of nether we call in Islam. It's kind of a formal uh, Islamic promise that if I finish my degree uh, with honors, that I will perform Hajj. So uh, I got the offer from uh, AT and T, uh, and I told them, uh, okay, I accept it, but I have to take 20 days off. In March, and uh, the interviewer told me, uh, Wissam, even our CEO doesn't get 20 days off a year. (laughs) 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 You're just Uh, starting in your entry position. But the belief that we were taught that your rizq, your bounties, your, 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 uh, what do you call it? Wherever, you know, you earn is written for you. That nobody can change it made me careless about what this guy's saying because you know you're not gonna change the way I'm gonna earn anything if it's written for me I'm gonna have it if not then not then you know I told him yeah well this is something I have to do and of course they withdrew the offer oh uh, my god <laughs> yeah and I went wow. I went to, I went to Hajj in the year 2000. Um, so you know that's one thing like and many 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 examples I mean. I used to take the example of uh, the Sahaba, the companions of the Prophet, Ahlul Bayt, you know, how uh, yeah. Imam Ali, who is the cousin of the Prophet and one of the early Muslims, used to leave his children for months and months and months. And then he came back from a battle that took him a few months. And then the, the, the Prophet Muhammad sent him to Yemen for six months. He barely saw his kids for, for, for a couple of days. Um, I took that as an example for me, a sacrifice. Like I can sacrifice seeing my daughter in this life and make this up in the hereafter. Wow! wow. And I was involved with tabligh. So I, every weekend, so I was I would work Monday through Friday, and then in the weekends, we would either go camping with the Muslim scouts, or we would go and tabligh. We would go to propagate Islam in different cities. Ta- Taking tabligh, that sacrifice tabligh means advertising, right? right. Yeah. Uh, propagating, advertising Islam. So you know, sacrifice, concept of sacrifice. There's there is a lot. There's a big package in Islam that makes you belittle 
your time in this life, belittle the quality of this life yeah. uh, for something that is in the hereafter. And that is, I feel, this is one of the most dangerous things in Islam. Yes. Because, you know, more, this more than suicide bombing, more exactly. than war. Exactly, because terrorism is, a, is yes. a minority. Exactly. But most Muslims, they hurt each other and they hurt themselves by this concept. Themselves, yes. more than anything they else. They neglect, yeah, they neglect. This, they neglect. This it, is, it, I this, mean, yeah. this is such a power, this is such an important point. I don't know, I don't want people to miss this because every time we talk about the cost of religion, people think about war and suicide bombing Terrorism. and, and, and yeah. child, child molesting priests and stuff like that. But all of that is important and tragic, but it's a small fringe cost compared to what just was explained here. If you add up all of the costs and all of the misery and all the opportunities missed, all the, uh, you know, all, all every every single moment that was spent on as another life rather than this one, all of that, the cost of that is way more than what you what you see in the news when it comes to the cost of religion. But anyway. yeah. And one example to that is hijab itself. Mm -hmm. You know, this subtle, subtle self-flagellation. You know, with all due respect to all the hijabis, uh, the hijab girls, they, they're comfortable with it. I respect your choice. I respect, uh, you know, and I defend your right wherever you are to 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 wear the way you the way you want. But my personal opinion is that um, that must be for the vast majority, according to just simple just biology, and it must be uncomfortable. Mm. And it's against the nature of of, of a human being. Uh, so that's just a subtle example of of self-flagellation, and we've you know we've I've struggled with that. Imagine as a you know all the strict laws of islam for looking hmm. you know gazing at girls imagine a guy going through high school and college uh, having to uh, self-flagellate for that hmm. having to self-control having to self-censor every uh, little look or feeling or it is torturous it is almost it's impossible biology always wins and you're setting up uh, people for uh, for failure, and that's why they will always they will always feel ashamed. They will always feel guilty. They will always be seeking forgiveness. Mm. I have a friend of mine who's very religious, and he's he's an angel, and he's lived, you know, he's in his fifties now, and he's, you know, whenever he talks to me, he's just so anxious for the forgiveness of God. And I said, what what did you ever do? I mean, what kind? I mean, that is what kind of a, of a, of a, of a God that mm. will punish you for anything? I mean, don't you see yourself? Like what what did you ever harm compared to the evil doers? That itself is is a is such a, a a feeling that is that is an obstacle in front of the progress of civilization, or right. it's unnatural. It's it's a, a, a excessive delusion. So so when it comes to the hijab, I think. Uh... The way the way the feel, you're right about the um, the the feeling that it gives the people that are wearing it, and I think it's more than mm, the message that it sends is more than just the discomfort of wearing the hijab, right? Um, and I think like the discomfort is secondary to the main damage uh, that the hijab does, because you know some people. I mean, I, I grew up in a, in a country where hijab was mandatory and. Um, most of the women around me were extremely liberal, and they you, mostly complained about the hijab in summertime, not during, not in winter. Like every time it got really hot, every, the complaints about hijab uh, hit, you know, was more than ever before. But so, but the thing is that discomfort itself, I think, is secondary to the fact that what we are telling the people that are wearing it and what it shows about their position in society. Right. And the example I give to that is that imagine if you are if you are talking to me and my wife and the three of us are speaking and while I'm speaking, all of a sudden my wife interrupts me and I look at her and I say, you just interrupted me. Go sit in the corner 
for half an hour and think about what you just did. And she listens and she goes, sits down in the corner of the living room. And you just look at me in amazement, like, what the hell just happened? Why, 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 what did you just do? What this is, this is, this is um, horrific the way that you're treating your wife. And I could respond to you and be like, what is wrong with sitting down? Sitting down is not that hard to do. We could just sit down together and that's not so hard. You could, you know, in fact, I'm t- feeling tired right now and I want to sit down right now. But that's not the point, is it? The mm-hmm. point is that you know there's such there's a major problem in this relationship. You, re- you Just by that, you see that if she has to listen to me and she does listen to me, you see that this is not a healthy relationship. You see that you, you realize about her position in this relationship and my role in this relationship. And just this act by itself indicates everything else uh, that is wrong about our relationship, right? And every um, there is indic in, indicates all the other ways that she probably is wrong in our relationship just by visiting that. So in a society where you live, where you get to tell women that you need to wear this, and they have to listen, and um, it just shows it just shows you their position in society. And even and worse is when they feel themselves that yeah, I have to wear this, right? Because it has the internal, like, it, it, I, like for example, if I tell my wife that you have to sit down, and she sits, she listens, and you may tell her to no, get up, you don't have to do this. If she comes and tells you like, no, this is right, I have to listen, I have to sit down here because I did something wrong, that doesn't make it better. You can't just be like, oh no, that's her choice. Then that shows that it's even worse. The situation is even worse that she has she has accepted this. But anyways, I went for mm. too long. Yeah, no, that that was actually. A dr- that, that's a yeah, really, that's a really good, good point. Analogy. That's a good point. Yes. And I've I've heard you say it before, but like it's, uh, but I, and I keep forgetting it. But that's a really really good way to illustrate it. Right. But um, so so with some, I just moving on to where you live. I've seen that you're relatively open about where you live. You do these conferences in Dearborn. I mean, I've been there. Um, it's again the largest sort of Muslim community. Uh, you are. Fairly open States. about how, uh, sorry, the largest Muslim community in the United States. In the United States, right. uh, you are uh, relatively uh, open about the kind of work you do and what you think. Um, how how does it play? I mean, there is a there are probably a lot of people listen to this or wondering if you have any security issues, whether you take any precautions, whether you've ever felt like there are people out to get you and they don't like what you do. So how does that play into it, or is has it changed over the years? What is um, sort of the situation I mean, when it comes to security? Yeah, I mean to tell you the truth, really, I'm a um, um, I'm a respected member of the community. I have contributed a lot, and I continue to contribute. I uh, I'm active in many nonprofit organizations. Um, I might be, uh, I seem to be a controversial person. Um, I'm brave about what I feel, what I think. Uh, and I'm brave to change my opinion whenever I, uh, I get convinced otherwise. And I express that publicly on my, on my social media, etc., on my website, blog, etc. Um, I've always spoken what I believe and I continue to do so. Uh, I believe in the truth. I believe that the word has to be out there. Uh, and I, I, I like the collective mind when, when, you know, when I post something and I feel, uh, I, I read the comments and uh, um, um, opinions. I actually, it, it actually shapes better my, my opinion, and I, mm. uh, I feel uh, enriched by, by the other opinions and comments, even if they're negative. You know, I, I, I see mm-hmm. other people's perspective and how they. So um, I, I don't feel, and we have a secular uh, um, also presence in the community. We're trying to make it more uh, outspoken, uh, claim its presence. Since the 60s in Dearborn, Islam has claimed the, the, the agenda of the community, but uh, secularism is on the rise, and we have many organizations uh, coming up that uh, represent uh, the uh, the more um, unreligious uh, or secular, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, part of society. Also, the newer generation does not connect with uh, religion the same way the the previous generation. I mean, research has shown that very clearly, especially with the attitude towards LGBTQ, etc. Mm. Uh, so, you know, there is a free thinking society, a new uh, organization in Dearborn that. 
uh, celebrates secularism. Um, Muslimish has been active, um, and other organizations that are actually secular. And I feel that most of the community is. Uh, it's just that silent, you know, that uh, um, Islam has a has a community power, you know, uh, religion uh, has a has a, a power of building communities, and that's mm. something that the secular movement is learning uh, how to build communities um, otherwise. Yeah, so you're you're talking about the younger people, how they're dissociating from religion. Just in your observation, since you live right in the midst of it, uh, you know, because because many of us don't. A lot of us, you know, who are a part of this sort of explicit movement or secular Muslim movement, whatever, um, we're not always closely in touch with it. But since since you're surrounded by it, have you? Do you have any personal uh, observations of? what young people are like um, in terms of how you used to see it when you were younger and comparing that to this new generation that's growing up around you, especially in the U.S.? Yeah, so unfortunately, there is there are a lot of indoctrinations for younger people through camps and uh, special programs for youth that is devout from critical thinking. It's not like they're encouraging people to uh, have critical thinking and question and understand Islam. No, it's just uh, teaching them how to accept and feel the same way as this template, you know. And and they do uh, recruit a lot of youth, and there are a lot of youth that are continue to be active uh, generation after generation. They have translated everything into English. Uh, they're rapping about Imam Hussein. They're uh, yeah. uh, you know they're doing majalis in English. Mm. The traditional um, Iraqi way of reciting uh, funeral passages, uh, you know, and uh, eulogies of Imam Hussein uh, and the, you know the, the Shia uh, school of thought, all the martyrs uh, of uh, of the family of the Prophet, they have converted that tradition into English. They've uh, created plays. They've, you know. Um, the so the some youth are stuck in that uh, environment. Mm. Um, They're very clever, very clever about their marketing. I've seen their methods. It's amazing how what they came up with. Right, but yeah. at, the, at the end of the day, there is also universities. We you know there's education, which is our our resort. Yeah. Is, <laughs> is the public education is uh, getting these critical thinking skills in the schools. Getting the education in the schools, getting to study biology and evolution in the school, mm. and then growing up in these academic institutions to question and understand and analyze and understand fact from myth. If these institutions are not doing that, they're betraying us. They're betraying the whole progress of civilization. They're mm. betraying the Enlightenment movement. They, they are betraying hundreds of years of progress. Mm. It goes back to this biology teacher in grade nine. You know, they yeah. are carrying the, the, the torch of the Enlightenment. Mm. And if they don't do the right job, especially if they want to cater to to making the parents happy instead of teaching kids science, then it's a disaster. So one, just one more question on this. Uh, you know, you said that you are, you know, well, you're a respected member of your community. You work with a lot of other um, organizations as well that are not necessarily related to secularism and everything, just in terms of community building. Um, uh, do you ever get, when you do your work with Muslimish, when you do your work with the secularization or ex-Muslims and so on, do, do you ever get any insights from the other Muslim community work that you do in terms of what they're doing right? Because, you know, you talked about this, I, they're doing camps, you know, they're doing the majalis in English and they're doing all of this stuff. Is there, what is it that we in the secular movement are not doing that they're doing that is so powerful um, in terms of community, in terms of giving activities to young people to do or, you know, providing some kind of meaning, identity, whatever it is. I mean, what are your observations of what we can learn from them? Yeah, so this is a big subject. We actually had a conference about building communities before. Uh, so there are there are certain elements that work very well, whether it is with religion, but they're very common with religion, or any movement for building a community. And there are many of them, but some of them is are rituals, for example, creating rituals. Yes. Uh, uh, rituals make us happy. 
uh, creating bonding, creating an environment of acceptance and bonding, inner circles, outer circles. Uh, so, you know, you go to the, to the mosque and uh, there are the outer circle, and then you have few families that you're friends with that you're going to go have a dinner with after a Friday prayer. That's the inner circle. So, you know, creating, creating the environment to, for larger circles, inner circles. Um, the uh, uh, values, shared values, it's very, very important to have shared values that are uh, that are common language uh, yeah. between us. This is a successful element of building community. There is really much to learn about building communities. It's not something that is only in religions. It's something that has evolved through our our culture. Uh, mm -hmm. We've depended on it. Um, it you formed tribes before, and now it forms communities. Yeah, actually, this is something I was just speaking about, and, and Toronto Ali was there as well. Um, and yeah. I think rituals is one important part. And, and again, it's hard for us. Um, it's hard for people like me to understand this because we don't need them. And we think like other people shouldn't need them either. But that's not reality. We should like try to understand hu humans, not based on our own experience, but based on what's like uh, what data shows. And people apparently need rituals. So we need to provide them that with, in a less harmful way than religion. Um and one thing I'll say, one thing I'll say, I think really helps when it comes to building these communities or tribes or stuff like that is, is stories, right? They need genesis stories, and they need genesis stories that has heroes and villains in there. And what what I'm thinking of doing is like coming up with tribes that is based on heroes and villains and stories that is based in reality and I've heard, and and what, another thing they, these stories need to be they need to be old again these are stuff that i don't need and i will never understand why people need them but they do need them and this is one thing i like about the enlightenment is that it has stories you could go into the story of i, I was thinking of creating um you know a tribe that is based on the enlightenment and we already have this heroes we have voltaire we have john locke we have uh, we could add even ibn sina uh, and Khayyam, Omar Khayyam, Omar Khayyam. Um, and again, that's something. I, I, what, uh, the speech was recorded, so I'm going to upload that. Uh, I'll send it to send you a link so you can check it out. If uh, let me know what you think. Once yeah, it was a... really good. And it's yeah. a lot of things actually, Armin, that we've been talking about on this podcast. I remember we've been talking about like the using of reason, and then like I remember I've talked so much about like the storytelling aspect and bringing art into it, learning what we can. Right and and so so of you you know like just in terms of rituals, um, uh, I I I want to get I'm actually going to be getting Phil Zuckerman uh, on the podcast who talks about secularizing religion, and he actually discusses all of this stuff in detail. So it, it'll be it'll be kind of interesting to have that conversation too. But um, yeah, I I agree that I agree that we do need a lot of that. I noticed something. I learned a lot from the Jordan Peterson phenomenon mm. and uh, Jordan Peterson, like, I, you know, not a huge fan, but a lot of people I knew that were atheists, you know, who had just come off the whole new atheism thing with Richard Dawkins, Dennett, Craig Hitchens and Sam Harris and all of that. And, and they're flocking to Jordan Peterson, who's talking about the Bible and talking about reconnecting to Christianity and talking mm. about, biblical archetypes and the importance of them and doing courses on that and people just eating up these lectures. And uh, the reason they were doing it was because he was giving them a sense of meaning mm. in their lives, uh, especially a lot of young, you know, men who feel for whatever reason, I mean, you know, the world is changing. It's, they don't have the same kind of position that they did throughout history. Uh, you know, everything's becoming more and more progressive. Uh, which overall, in my opinion, is a, is a force for good with some issues. But what he did was he provided a sense of meaning, and that immediately alerted me to the fact that all of this stuff with the new atheism was working very well on me. But for most people out there who are looking for that sense of belonging and that meaning, um, it wasn't working for them. So it's exactly you know what Armin was saying, is that for us, we don't need it, so we somehow assume that everybody else must be like us, but um, apparently... Or could be not. like us. Or could be yeah. like us. So, I, I and one thing that I get from you, Basam, the way that you speak just overall, 
Yeah. Um, I don't know if it's the if the imam left in you and the speaking in the <laughs> inspirational way or whatever it is, but uh, when you speak, you sound a lot to me like uh, when the way that you know you would describe Richard Dawkins' rights or the way that Carl Sagan used. To yeah, speak I was or, getting a Carl Sagan vibe every uh, the entire time you were uh, speaking. Yeah, there's a there's it's weird when you talk. There's a weird kind of. Uh, oh, that sounds really, really creepy. I'm sorry. Don't don't feel <laughs> creeped out. But there's a weird. It doesn't actually. I I react emotionally to it, and I wonder yeah, if. Yeah. Um, mashallah. It got... <laughs> you got I Armin think, to say mashallah. I I think. Yeah. <laughs> I think I think all of us actually we we speak uh, we speak from our hearts, and uh, that's why you know it uh, it really gets you know it's we're not only speaking you know I'm not. Uh, you know, teaching um, or speaking about mathematics, you know, I'm speaking about something that uh, has affected my life, continues to affect my life, continues to affect everyone around me who I love every day. Uh, it's, it's, you know, it's such a topic that, like, I know that tonight there are a lot of pain that is that can be relieved just with a little bit of, of you know, removing these some of these delusions you know, removing some of these. I know a lot of people tonight are, are sleeping with shame. Some people are sleeping with suppression. Yeah. The amount of suppression, I mean, I don't want to even get to that. The amount of suppression, like uh, suppressing everything that is natural and beautiful about us. Um, there's a lot of work uh, for us to do, and uh, it all goes back to, to education, to uh, which is our, our last resort and really... Mm. Uh, confronting everything else the stories part is very important uh, that you mentioned both i heard you also speak about it in in harvard uh, uh, ali mm -hmm. yeah the story i mean our mind works in the stories it doesn't work in you know facts and bullets so right. the story part is very and we have a rich history of story yes. of stories i mean i want to say something uh, that might be useful for others that you know one of when i when 2000 2008 i was researching I was hit with the four, four, you know, horsemen. I was hit with, with. I was just in the perfect timing when that wave was coming out, of scientists speaking out. Richard Dawkins uh, and Hitchens and uh, uh, Daniel Dennett and you know all these uh, Sam Harris and um, and some some say you know some especially. Um, uh, liberal, you know, apologists sometimes they feel that. Uh, some of these were were harsh, but it actually I listened to Carl Sagan all my life. Yeah, mm. but it never stirred questioning in me. Mm. He was so nice. I was always saying Subhanallah after his statements, you know, because <laughs> <laughs> he was so nice. He was he was focused on science and trying not to touch any sentiments of people. Mm. But when and and you know Richard Dawkins was speaking before and others were speaking before, but when they decided that you know what now we're gonna put our hand on the uh, cut and right. show people that there is a cut here, although it's painful, you know it stirred me and it stirred me. And the first time I was trying to actually answer uh, at that time, you know, the God delusion came out, and I was trying to formulate answers to it. Uh, but then I started, you know, understanding his points and uh, he started coming through to me and understanding his, his point of view and his concern about humanity and about uh, people's perception of science, etc. So sometimes we, you know, uh, we need to we need to be a little bit vocal, be a little bit, you know, uh, aggressive, aggressive a little bit to make people understand uh, that, you know, it's, it's called, you know, understanding by shock. Mm. Letting them hear the shock because that's one of the ways of, of understand. Not everyone understands by, exactly. uh, you know, uh, smooth uh, ways. So I appreciate yeah, I, people who are harsh with me. I appreciate that. No, yeah. I, I, I see, and I actually, see what you're saying. And uh, yeah, and I and I also think that it's a, it's if you if you do not if you do not uh, provide that, then if you think you're being nice to people by not being aggressive by not providing that alternative just imagine the people that would have thanked you that are not thanking you because you were being nice to them and you you took something from them i think you you denied them an alternative way of thinking and that's not at all nice that's not being nice to people 
You think yeah. you you sound nice, but you you're actually denying them an alternative way of looking at the world. Yeah. But go on. And, and and the the other thing is like I I and I I do agree that different. I think that different approaches work on on different people. And this I always talk about myself and uh, you know Alishba, who you know my wife. Uh, she had the same experience you did. Uh, she was kind of going through like a, a smiley background, went through a Sufi phase, and then uh, she was uh, the, the one, one, this, this guy that she knew once was having a discussion with her, and then she said something sort of, I, I don't know what it was, uh, but you know, he just told her, he's like, well, I don't know what to do, that's just stupid. And mm. she got really pissed, and that eventually was the trigger that mm. got her to where she is now, just sort of like what you're describing. For me, though, uh, Carl Sagan was a huge thing. I was uh, that actually did make me question. Mm. You know, I, I I did start questioning even when I was younger. I mean, I, I I guess you're right in the sense that I didn't really start really questioning. Um, it became I became more agnostic, but but he mm. opened up avenues. He made me look at things, and it was in very stark contrast to what I was hearing around me in Saudi Arabia. Because you know I was growing up in Saudi Arabia, so it was a very, very different thing that I was hearing there. So um, I think different yeah. approaches do work on different people, and it's just a really good thing that we have all these different voices here. Yeah. Yeah. I, I do appreciate you mentioning the shame because I think that's a, again, it's not a another one of the major costs, right? I don't know if it, I don't know if people appreciate how much shame and how much disgust and how much self hate exists out there because of religion and because of what people 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 are just looking at the desires that they naturally have or about who they are and what they want and the dreams and the things that they're afraid of and the things that they're questioning and just the mere questioning makes them feel with with hatred for for themselves the fact that they can't be certain about things the fact that they want things that they're not supposed to be wanting and i think that this amount of self-hatred is extremely damaging and the amount of misery that is causing i think a lot of people don't understand how big of a deal that is so it's, yeah. yeah and if muslims just think like sometimes in the bigger picture like if if what if you look at uh, muhammad as a person, I mean, Muhammad has come to a society that had a very uniform belief. and Alleg- Allegedly. Uh, allegedly. And he, <laughs> uh, and he revolted against that uh, general belief, uh, that general uh, customs, this general. And he was a minority for years. And for 13 years in Mecca, uh, basically, it was an unsuccessful message. Just few slaves and children and few relatives and uh, one or two friends who followed him. And he revolted against that system. What yeah. if the message to be learned from Muhammad is how to question what you have inherited? Instead of just inheriting what Muhammad has taught, why not learning from his actions rather than learning from his words and learn how to question what you have inherited from your parents and society and what kind of revolution you want to do like Muhammad did a revolution and chose the way of life that he believed was the better way and that, that made more sense oh so sometimes God. Muslims have to break break these bird you know these these barriers that make them think in a certain way and think just in a l- larger picture in Irshad we've chosen to you know uh, what if we want to Select. I mean, the Quran comes from uh, from uh, from a be- beautiful uh, structure, beautiful uh, a lot of beautiful language, uh, beautiful uh, eloquence in it. It also comes from poetry. a heritage, poetry. It comes from a long heritage. It's not coming from a vacuum. So uh, there are a lot of positive messages in the Quran. There are messages that are negative messages in the Quran that probably mm. do not. The, 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 at least we can say is that do not fit our age at all. They're considered uh, improper now. Some, of course, you can also argue that they're improper all the time, of course. But uh, what? Not, why not be selective? Why not select what isn't isn't uh, uh, Islam? Ha, you know, didn't the Prophet do the same thing? He selected from Christianity. He selected from Judaism. He selected from paganism. Half of the Hajj was pagan. Even the prayer was pagan. He selected the things that worked and that were positive. And why not we select things that are also positive okay. for us? 
Can I change? Can I change? Uh, little, change a little bit what you said to make it more in line with my promotion of enlightenment rather than Islamic reform, uh, which is sounding a little bit like that. <laughs> Um, exactly. That was that was a message for Muslims, uh, Armin. Yeah, I know, I know. But I'm what I'm when it comes to brand, I, I'm not. I'm going to change it a little bit just to make it like I like them both, but I'm just changing it a little bit uh, to tell you what my style would be. Uh, I would say like, yeah, look at what Muhammad did. He, you know, you could fall. Uh, but but I would. So you're saying that Muhammad was doing uh, question you know going rebelling basically and that's what maybe that's the message as well that to question and change and see what works right uh but what i would change is like okay yeah see that what worked and maybe follow that model even if it wasn't muhammad's intention to teach you that because it's obvious that it was not in his intention to teach you that his intention was like no follow islam this is the final message this is perfect you, you don't need to do what i did anymore because this is i'm the seal of the prophets i mean you could see in the quran and the and the hadith that it, the message was done that you go ahead now and you question everything as well including islam that was not the message it's pretty obvious that that was not the message uh but I, but what you could say that even if that was not the message you could learn this from it right mm -hmm. You could right. so, but be honest about the fact that the intention was not that. The intention was not for you to follow Muhammad's way and question everything and rebel. The intention was you to follow Islam without questioning. But you could still learn from Muhammad's success that maybe you could do what True. Muhammad did. Right? True. I agree so, with you 100%. That's why I call it reimagine Islam, not reinterpret. Exactly. Perfect. Oh my God! I'm going to use 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 that line as well. I, I think I, you've just. This is. I, this may be one of the most fun things that Armin has ever come across. Like this <laughs> alternative to. But right. but I but, I. but also when it comes to picking and choosing from the Quran, as long as you understand that you're using the source of the picking and choosing is you. It's not God that is, you know, so given that you are deciding what's good and what's not, it is your moral standards. You have a superior moral standards than the book that you're looking at. And if you are deciding what's good and what's not, that means the source is not the book. You're the source. Right. If, if you understand that, then go ahead and pick and choose. Yes, and I can explain this Islamically. I know this is not the place to do it, but I mean, there is... Uh, so in, uh, regarding reform, I know that we didn't want to jump into the subject that we've mentioned a hundred times today. <laughs> but uh, uh, but I know I've heard you're talking about this. I mean, I, I hear your podcast, guys. You know, this is yeah. um, and I love your podcast about circumcision. Uh, <laughs> that's yeah. for me like Thank a you. reference. Now, anyone who wants, I don't even talk to them about the subject. I just send them to you to, to that because uh, <laughs> that really covered it very well. But um, uh, so regarding reform, you know, I've I've, I've given a, a talk in New York, uh, abolish versus reform. Oh. Um, and it might be, you know, I understand the point of view that maybe abolish is the right thing. I understand if you say that. I understand if you say that abolish is the right thing. But sometimes we're not talking about the right thing. Sometimes we're talking about, you know, what what would happen? Like what's that, you know, it's like politics. What's what's realistic? Uh, what's natural? Um, what's more natural is for things to evolve and uh, reform. Because we've seen, I mean, it's a whole talk I gave, but we've seen trials of trying to abolish things and they actually backfire. Even the French Revolution, you know, uh, decades of uh, de-Christianization of the country, uh, it backfired to bring the church uh, up and strong. Yeah. And, and it was harmful, actually. The de-Christianization, if you go to France and you see all everything that was destroyed in the name of de-Christianization, you know, it was, although it was in the name of enlightenment or reason, or reason, it was harmful. So I feel that reform might be more natural. Um, mm. it, not everyone needs it. But okay, do we have another be... hour or two now? <laughs> no, no, we don't have. But no, can, but I, can I, I just? I know, no, no, can I just? I, 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 can I, I, I know. I know what you're gonna say, but I have to say one thing before because I know you're gonna talk for longer. So yeah. I just have to say one thing that I actually. So this is one place where I disagree with it. I like. I think that what is realistic is what you guys are doing with mm. the questioning and the doubt and the yeah. space for that. The reform people just over time, having seen what's going on with it. I don't feel that it has gone as far as what you're it's doing. Backfired. That's the one yeah, that has backfired. What, what ex-Muslims are doing. There are more people now saying that, okay, I'm leaving this. And there are 
nobody prospectively becomes a reformer. You're talking about the French Revolution. You're talking about the Enlightenment. You're talking about like the Voltaire and the Rousseau and all of that. Those are not people who said, let's reform it. Let's dilute it and change it a little bit. They didn't do that. It's actually reform happens when you have people who go out and they try to abolish and completely disrupt something. And then the result of that is this sort of watered down, diluted version. You don't start with the watered down, diluted version. And that's why I think that it, reform is more of a, it's a byproduct. Yes. But it should, I don't think it should be a prospective ambition. You, you, do you know, do you understand what I mean? Yes, I think, I'll take, I'll take the byproduct as, as, you know, accepting it as an ally. Rather no, than yeah, yes, we, we, we do no, that. No, no. Okay, okay. We, even, uh, even Armin does that, I think. Well, I like the people, not the concept. Okay, yes, first of all, yes. we know. The, so, he, the, well, like Ali said, the reform is a byproduct. It's a defensive byproduct of a larger movement, which is the abolish movement. Right? The abolish movement causes the reform movement to happen. It's not that people decide to reform a religion, even with Christianity or Islam. People decide to reform them because people are challenging the religion. So some people try to keep the religion alive by trying to reform it. It's a defense mechanism. It's not something that started the whole thing, right? So yeah. even even if you like reform, <laughs> you push for abolishing it because you get reform as a side product when you actually attack the religion, right? You have a and, better chance of achieving reform if you right. use the abolish thing, even if you don't want to. Yeah, but also you know, historically. But when it comes up, but here's the thing: even if it's a side product, I still don't accept it. I don't, I don't accept the reform movement as an ally. I accept the reformers, the people that are trying to do reform as an ally, because they usually are this have the same goals. Um, when they're fighting for secularism, when they're fighting for democracy, when they're fighting for free speech or women rights and gay rights, I see them as allies because they are pushing for the same things. The only thing that I do not support them on is when they try to give the religion credit for all the great work they doing they're doing all the great work and i support them in the great work they're doing and i try to help them in the great work, the work they're doing i just stop short when they say oh by the way this is islam this is christianity and try to give the religion credit for it i try to cry because that's what makes it the islamic reform it's not islamic if you do secularism or if you do women rights or if you do gay rights that's just pushing for great ideas it becomes islamic reform when you add islam when you actually try to give islam credit for it and that's damaging and i try to stop that Again, I'm not against reform. I'm against Islamic reform. I'm for Muslims reform. What you're what you're advocating for is uh, is Muslims reforming, and I'm for that. Muslims reform by being less influenced by Islam, right? And and la another thing is that when you think that this what we're trying to do is unrealistic, we're not abolishing. It's not like oh, it's too much for some people, but it, the, pushing for enlightenment values. Is is an you say like evolving is a more natural thing? Yeah, we're we're not, we're also pushing for just baby steps or evolving. Like I said, the ref, pushing for reform. If you understand it, ref, what, what Islamic reform means, reinterpreting verses, that's lying to people. But you could evolve, you could slowly evolve, and you could get baby steps by doing what you're doing by by providing a home for people that are questioning, questioning, doubting, being confused. That's not understanding things, admitting that you don't understand it. That's intellectually honest. And that's also a slow progress. That's baby steps. But the, bit, but the difference between that and reforming is that it's not, it doesn't involve lying to people about obvious scripture. Again, so when people say, oh, abolish or reform, abolish seems too harsh. Some people need reform. They don't understand that the whole pushing for abolishing also has its own baby steps, also has its own evolving process that is not all or none. It's not atheism or nothing else. But even though it has baby steps, it's not, it doesn't involve pushing for religion and it doesn't involve lying to people. Anyways. Right. I mean, a Muslimish is obvious about what they're doing. We're not doing reform in Muslimish, as you exactly. said. Yeah. But but what I mean is, and of course, this needs like an episode by itself. But uh, in the meanwhile, uh, what's going to happen, and it's natural in every religion, just like what happened to reform Judaism and what happened to reform Christianity in all its thousands of forms, uh, it's inevitable. I mean, I can talk right. about the history of Islamic reform too. It's just late. Islamic reform is late, but it is happening. 
and I can give you examples. I agree. No, we no, don't no, have no, time. No, no, you don't <laughs> have to. And because I agree with you, like aside, right. a, a definite side product of us pushing for abolishing religion is reform movements, right? Many reform movements. I agree that that's inevitable. Sometimes it's a byproduct. Sometimes it's initiated by itself, but. No, but but what I'm saying, just because it's a, just because I agree with you that it will definitely happen, that doesn't mean that we have to push for it. Just because you know we don't have to make it stronger, we don't have to advertise. Well, it. I mean, what some saying that they're not pushing for it. We're not. Right. I think we're kind not, of we agree more Muslim-ish. than we disagree. Right, yeah. but yeah. me as an individual, uh, me myself, and I know this is a unique situation. I am part of uh, a reform movement, and I am part of a non-reform movement at the same time. Uh, so I can I can I can find that duality in working with both organizations, but that needs you know uh, more time to talk about really. Yeah. And how can I manage uh, being in both and being pragmatic to that extent? I I uh, disagree with. I think one of them is not and not only not helpful. One of them pushing for the reform movement is pushing for keeping the religion rela- relevant for longer. I and think all of even, the negative things that we talked about, like you know people's right. shame and, I, and all of that. Yeah. And I think given given that pushing for abolishing the religion already gets you the reform side product, why not just keep pushing for reform? Because reform is a side product and an excuse for to keep the religion relevant for longer. And we don't want to keep the religion for longer. Even if you ha- enjoy some of the side products from the reform movement, well, then keep for, pushing for more abolishment of religion because you're going to get the side product anyways. Yeah. I'd love to uh, hook you up with someone who will speak on behalf of a large reform Islamic movement. Okay, let's do that. And that oh, would be we'd really, love that. Uh, yes. That would be really wonderful. Yeah, we can finally have like a full, full, like proper episode on that. Um, yeah, like, and really... <laughs> we could tell the patrons that are tired of this discussion to just skip that episode because. <laughs> <laughs> no, and then oh, I I will at the end of, on that episode. I will probably just sit back and just. You know, <laughs> get some popcorn and yeah, I don't even have to say a word, but uh, it was okay. some, th- thank you so much, man. I mean, this was just so, uh, you're, the way that you speak, I was thinking when you're talking about Muharram and Majalis, I was wondering if we should do a thing for kids. The way that you're talking, I feel like yeah, it's a kind of thing that young people and children should do. Like maybe do like a, I, I did this like some time ago, many, many years ago, I think it was 2007, no, 2006, seven or something like that. Uh, where the 10 days of Muharram, um, everybody in my family was going to all these majalis. And so what I did was I got like a bunch of people who were like like me, uh, uh, mostly younger people. And I had them come over uh, to my place and I put on videos of, I think the BBC Horizon series was big then with all the Brian Cox documentaries about time. And there was another one about relativity, another one about consciousness. We would do that. Then I found this movie about uh, the Imam was saying the Karbala thing, and we talked about it critically. So every day we watched a different thing, and it was a lot of fun. I just never did it since then, and now I'm wondering if, uh, you know, we can actually take, you know, because we're talking about rituals and everything. Maybe we take that and we turn it into a sort of a camp majalis type thing for kids and uh, talk to them about all of these things, the stuff that we're talking about today. I, I don't know. Yeah. And I yeah. There are a lot of there are a lot of uh, uh, experiments out there in building communities and rituals. Uh, you're going to be speaking on October 25th, a day before the conference. I will. Yes. In in the Center for uh, Humanistic Judaism, which is yeah. basically an atheistic Judaism Judaism uh, movement, and they have created uh, a humanistic rituals, which you will witness. Uh, wow. by yourself. I want to see that. How come I'm not invited to any of these events? Uh, you are invited, Arm. If you can make it, <laughs> no. we'll be honored. Oh, are you already you. gone by then? Oh, shit. You're gonna be yeah, gone I'm going to be in Philippines. Yeah, I, I've always back? said that. No, I, well, I mean, I'm gonna. I'm still doing events and stuff. People are still like inviting me to go speak at their events and stuff. But I'm not gonna be able to just go to events because I can't afford the flights myself. So I have to like get invited so I could. So they t- they bring me over. So, but sure. yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. But I'm gonna be, I think, in Israel in November. So that's another event I'm gonna be speaking. We, at. Uh, yeah. this event is about science and Islam. So we focused really on inviting. Um, uh, I'm just and, kidding. I'm no, kidding. Don't take I mean, it seriously. No, definitely. We, we, you are on our radar. Oh. Um, we would love well, to I'm have. I'm honored you. to be on your radar. Yeah. So I'm gonna plug. I'm gonna plug the event. Well, not just because I'm speaking at it, but October 26th, 
Uh, this is in uh, it's in uh, Michigan. Link, uh, in Detroit, the description. Michigan. Link in the description to go. Link is. Kit. Yeah, it's in the description. Go to Muslimish.org if you want to find out more about not just about the event, uh, October 26th, yeah. but also about just Wissam and the work that he does at Rahim and what Muslimish does. And it is uh, yeah, follow it, it them. Is, uh, Link again, follow them on Twitter and Facebook, link in the description. Yep, and, and of uh, course, I'm going many to... People, we are just uh, a member. There are many people who are doing great jobs in Muslimish. Yeah, yeah. yeah no, it's the, a fantastic the... organization that needs... A, I, 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 really sup- I really like the work they do, and they need a lot more attention. That they, I mean, they're doing more work. The work that they're doing deserves a lot more attention than it's getting. So right. go follow them and support them in any way you can. Yep. And uh, the thing, uh, so yeah, October 25th, I'll be speaking at the Center for Humanistic Judaism uh, in Detroit. It's going to be uh, a talk about, uh, it's going to be Islam in quotes versus Muslim in quotes. And Mm -hmm. uh, what does the word Muslim mean, how that evolves into Muslimish and so on. So it'll be a kind of interesting topic on uh, the idea of identity because, you know, you've got atheist Jews talking about it. I've got a book called The Atheist Muslim, so it'd be kind of interesting. There's a difference, though. Muslim course, is not an ethnicity. Ethno religion. One. That th- really, Armin. That's exactly what I'm going to be talking about. about <laughs> no, be I know, about but I'm first. telling. I'm not telling you. I'm telling the audience. Jesus, I know you I know. know. It. But there yeah, are similarities. There, there is a formulation of of nationalism within the Islamic identity, which we can talk uh, about. We, later. we are. We are. We're going like to discuss Omas, all of that. Nish, like Darul, <laughs> Darul Islam, and Darul Harb. Is that what you're referring no, to? No, no. We're going to be talking about how the word Muslim is is evolving and in some places it can be considered as a birth identity sort of like Gallup oh, and Pew guys, considered to be you guys are just trying to change the definition of Muslim I'm gonna fight that but anyways. I mean, you haven't even heard the talk you have no idea I'm what I'm guessing gonna I'm guessing is it okay yeah, to guessing. guess you, yeah. it's okay to guess yeah. so in any case we're gonna do that um, and then and then it'll be the conference the next day on Islam and science I also want to the next uh, episode that you're gonna hear after this one is going to be an excellent, excellent talk that Armin did on uh, oh. called Enlightenment Values Under Attack. Uh, he did it here in Mississauga. I was in the audience, and it was just fantastic. I've never heard Armin actually properly just riff and go solo and just talk <laughs> like that. I, I've Thank heard him you. react, but like I absolutely loved it. He, he covered uh, the religion thing, criticism of religion. He covered it in the context of the culture wars that are happening right now, and it was just all encompassing and, and probably one of the most relevant things that you're going to hear uh, for the oh, times wow. we're living in. So, what a great endorsement. Thank you. Yeah, man. do check that out. I'm plugging everybody right now. So, <laughs> with some... and all I do, every, I keep shitting on everything Ali says, and then he comes back and he's so nice to me. Thank you, Ali. <laughs> I'm, I'm, a, I'm very secure. I'm a very secure <laughs> person. I do, I, do I compliment people too much? I do compliment people too much. Right? No, no, I like it. Don't stop. Just keep doing it. <laughs> <laughs> well, for some reason, everybody says that. No, your relationship it. on this podcast is exemplary, you guys. You, uh, <laughs> you exemplify rationalism. <laughs> uh, uh, that's the way it's supposed to if be. If this was on an Arabic show, you would be fighting in fists in the first five minutes. You know? <laughs> oh, I, uh, speaking of that, I have to plug one last thing. All right. And I don't know if Vidu Vids is listening, but uh, with some, I don't know if you've seen this, but Vidu Vids and Armin Navabi did a Shia versus Sunni thing where they're mm-hmm. sitting on a couch and debating whether Shiaism is better or Sunniism is better. And this is an ex Shia and an ex Sunni talking about which one was better. And it was the funniest fucking thing oh. I have seen in the longest time because they're, they're both of them have left it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And then Armin is there cursing Aisha. And then, you know, he was <laughs> like, what? She's the mother of all believers. What are you doing? And you just know that neither of them is serious about it because nobody, it's just the funny, just the best video. I heard you came up with that idea. I am actually jealous that I didn't come up with that, um, or I wasn't part of it. Whatever it is, but it was. Just so it's called. It's brilliant. called. What is so. it called again? The video X Shia versus X Sunni. I think right. X Shia versus X Sunni. Search uh, for the... that on YouTube. You should be able to find it. Yeah. I don't want to yeah, be yeah. creating an X Unity again. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be good. Yeah. I, I I like it. I like where this thing's going. I honestly like uh, in Amsterdam. All of the people I met. I mean, there's a the new generation of people doing this and they're all so interesting and there's yeah. different contexts and different I like flavors how we're, to it. I like how we are all these different groups like XMNA, Muslimish, Secular Jihadists, Council of Ex-Muslim of Great Britain, Ex-Muslim of Norway, Ex-Muslim of Sweden. Atheist Republic. 
Aces Republic. I, I like the fact that we're all working together, and the challenge is like we are we are going to have like drama and internal fighting and stuff like that. And we had that a lot, uh, but still, it didn't stop us from doing cross group, you know, collaboration work, right? Mm -hmm. Because drama will happen. Every movement as it grows is going to have internal fighting and drama and stuff like that. But if we could meet that, you know, if we could just the ones that are leading all these groups, if we could like just ignore that and continue working with each other, I think I, I'm seeing more and more of that. Like I'm seeing like all like the, instead of like trying to compete with each other, I'm seeing that they see a lot of value in working with each other. And I think that's the recipe for the success of this movement. Yeah, I think I think all of, all of us have sort of done that and yeah. kind of waded through. I'm seeing it. it's just beautiful. I, I, yeah. I fucking I love I, when we do collaborative work, with different organization. That just warms my heart. I don't know how to explain uh -huh. it, but it's fantastic. Yeah, no, no, it is. I I love where it is right now. I mean, we had we we had Sarah on the Bill Maher show. Like, yes, I mean, I it's haven't... just the whole thing is it's very mainstream. Just the idea we had Hamza. Uh, this is a Pakistani kind of reference, so you guys won't Sarah's get it, show. but. Well, one of the biggest uh, actors and celebrities in Pakistan, Hamza Ali Abbasi, who's a personal friend of Imran Khan, the prime minister, has right. done two episodes on Harris Sultan's podcast. And, right. you know, I think I don't even think the content is relevant. It's just the idea that they know that there is an opposition. There's a one to one opposition yes. now is just massive. The optics of this is, uh, and is incredible. And honestly, Sarah, again, I have to post about this at some point. Uh, I just got from trip, uh, uh, but I the Sarah showing up on Bill Maher. That's a huge step forward for all of us. For all of us, mm -hmm. they mentioned. I mean, even if she just didn't say a single word, right? Even pa just and, and saying, she did a good job. She did a really. I know good she did a very good job. Yeah, she did. Yeah. But even if she didn't have to, like she did them. Obviously, Sarah Hader. She will always do a great job. But just just the introduction alone was a huge leap forward for all of us. Just saying the word ex-Muslim on such a platform to, that uh, when it comes to normalizing the, our existence, I think that was a major achievement. You know, so thank you for Sarah for going there. Yeah. So anyway, uh, Muslimish is, uh, I just went to their last meetup here in Toronto. Oh yeah. So every single time. So runs the chapter for Muslimish and ex here here in, uh, in Toronto. Right. Um, so he is uh, every time I go there there's I'm like so jealous people. that you're so close to all this activity by the way no, there, there's, a, there's a, I met a new person from Turkey who just arrived three days ago in Muslimish. Can you guys I met another guy from Kuwait who just came six weeks ago then I met this guy who the last time I met him was 2001 I went to mm. his house to record some music stuff and then he showed up he's like you know we met in 2001 and I vaguely remembered I'm like holy shit like this is and we're all meeting at this one place. It's just Can every time I go there. Can you guys open more Muslim chapters around North America? Can you... Yes, they're all on the on the website. Uh, yeah. Toronto. You want me to mention them now? Yes, yes. Uh, well, to, you know, Detroit, Toronto, New York, Boston, uh, Atlanta, San Francisco, L.A., Houston. Where else? Mm. How many did I mention? Chicago. Um, We've we've wanted to start outside, but you know we can't really uh, help people if they get in trouble. So that's why we refrain from going outside right. North America. Um, I want to say just one thing: uh, if people, you know, people, I know you have a, a large crowd uh, listening to uh, this beautiful and successful uh, podcast. Uh, that you know, every single effort, every single support really counts. In 2009, when I was going through transformation and I was looking for something about science, I found a little meeting in the basement of a little library in one of the cities close by. And I went there and there was a scholar talking about, they had a university professor as a, as a guest speaker is talking about scientific method. And there was about six people in the audience, all of them like above the age of 60 except me and two other friends who are in the process of our existential meltdown and questioning and we were sitting down and writing and taking notes and that was like an important lecture for us for them it was just another boring unsuccessful meeting they that's how they perceived it and then they you know that was the last meeting of that of that chapter and mm. we were lucky to catch the last meeting of that chapter which was very important to us you, you know i did one meetup 
for Muslim in in uh, in one of the theaters. You just just a, a social outing, uh, film, and you know we're a bunch of friends, so we went there. And I told them I'm gonna make it a meetup, you know, just in case someone likes to join us. So one girl joined us, who's been living for nine years in Dearborn, but did not know that there's such people live here. She thought everyone here is religious. So she was living for nine years without two friends until she found this meetup and she showed up. And now she's 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 uh, the, the vice president of the Detroit chapter. Uh, <laughs> and she's going to be the MC of the first section in the conference. You know, so these small things, just a meetup or just the opportunity here and there, please never, never look down at it. If you're listening to this episode, help the movement in any way possible. Thank you. Yes, yeah. please do. Link in the description again. Good. There you go. Everybody, thank you very much. Thank you for listening again. And uh, uh, thank you, Wassam. Thank you, Armin. Uh, thank you, me. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> we'll see you guys you. next time. Thank you, Ali. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Yes, right. bye. We can stay. So, uh, Wassam, you can we don't, stay. We, yeah, we don't thank Ali enough. Yeah, thank you, Ali. <laughs> oh, what? Yeah. All right, yeah. bye. Yeah. The Secular Jihadists have been made possible thanks to the Illuminati and the covert support of Israel and the CIA. That's what we have been told, but we haven't received our checks yet. If you like what we do, please support us. Share the podcast with your friends, write and tweet us with topic and guest suggestions, or head over to secularjihadists.com and give a dollar or more for exclusive access to live video. Have your questions read and answered on the air and more. Till next time, may the flying spaghetti monster be with you. Thank <laughs> you.